All right. Hey, everybody. Hey, Facebook Live. I hope this is showing up a little bit better than before. I am going to uh, close out of uh, that, and I'm going to make sure that I have enough memory on my machine. Oh, I don't have very much memory. So I'm going to free up that memory on my little tool here. But today, I want to uh, kind of do a little bit of a blast from the past, because as, as you're reading off of the description, I have been hard at work this week, and I've driven, and I've gone to my alma mater, and I've uh, gone back to the graduate program that I graduated from, and there was an industry conference that was going on. It's an excellent conference, and I was really surprised to see... Um, how little uh, some things changed uh, in the last few years. And if you're not familiar uh, with what's been going on with me, I started out very heavy in the knowledge management space, in the instructional design space, in the space where I am working a lot with subject matter experts and I'm designing e-learning and I uh, went from there and I joined my local ATD chapter for the Association for Talent Development and then I helped save that chapter and then I joined, I was actually nominated for the board of that chapter and then I served that chapter. It was one of the top 10 largest chapters and over here on the other hand, I started uh, continuing to contract and do contract works in the ph pharmaceutical industry and a number of other industries, which sounds more glorious sometimes than it is, and it's very deadline-driven, and uh, did a lot of diligent work there as well. And then I took some of the lessons learned, and I came up with some books and some content, uh, published this with ATD Press. Uh, it was named something else back then. Uh, I'm really glad they rebranded uh, since then. But uh, basically, I went from there after several years of this, after getting my Certified Professional in Learning and Performance certification, I actually let that expire because I wasn't using it because I wanted to help individual people in the thought leader space, and I've done that for several years as well. And so I went back to the conference to learn and to observe what's going on, because I kind of had a little bit of an intuitive question around the whole idea of uh, organizations and sharing of knowledge in organizations, or perhaps the lack of sharing of knowledge in organizations. And I thought, you know, is this still a thing? Is there still, for a majority of organizations, maybe not the best in class any longer, but for still a majority or even a large minority of organizations, is the pain that these organizations have of hiring expensive subject matter experts to do work and to interface and to basically extract their knowledge and uh, in many cases, these subject matter experts do that. In some cases, they may or may not do that. And in many cases, almost all cases, if you've got a subject matter expert, then you have to, if you're an organization, you have to hire on another professional called a instructional designer or a curriculum designer or a staff member or someone just to extract the knowledge out of the brain of the expert who has the curse of knowledge, meaning they think it's so obvious that they're not even designing the content themselves. Hey, Dave Ferguson, good to see you, my friend. I, I'm glad that you were able to, to drive some race cars here recently. I'd love to catch up with you about that sometime. But uh, anyway, I am just amazed that not only have subject matter experts not been given, in many cases, this skill of being able to just design their own learning and have best practices, as I recommended, close to 10 years ago in this book so that organizations would not have to hire additional people, twice the, the people that they needed to. But not only that, but many subject matter experts are, uh, shall we say, reluctant or even crabby, or too busy. Now, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious. I'm being a little bit uh, over the top right now. But when you think about it, I mean, is that really effective? Is that really efficient? 
I don't know. So my question to my colleagues is, how is this still a thing? How is it still a thing that these subject matter experts don't know the basics of design and they're actually in many cases pushing back against the design of instruction and being worked with and in some cases even hoarding the knowledge still. And it makes so much sense to me because at the same time that I can't believe that this is still happening seven or eight years after I wrote the book, I can believe it on the other hand because it's human nature and really knowledge, and that's the topic here today, knowledge is not really the answer. Knowledge was never the answer. I would say at this point in my awareness, I'm just going to spoil this whole thing. I'm going to say knowledge is not the answer. Having a healthy culture is the answer. And that that is a even harder thing to do for organizations than knowledge management, okay? Now, I want to just cut to the chase right now, and I'm going to show you a few things here. And this is, uh, this is my attempt to, uh, to be a little bit like that, that guy, Brendan Burchard, that had little post-it notes and he would take it off. That's what I'm going to do for you here right, right now. So I'm going to talk with you about five expired assumptions about knowledge management that are actually going to cost your organization a pretty penny. I, I got to find a way to put it on the table here, sorry, so that you can still see this. I know this is kind of this kind of low end here, my friends. Here we go. Five expired assumptions. All right, they were true maybe when I wrote this book in 2009, or when I wrote this book, this white paper, really for ATD Press. A couple years after that, they might have been accurate at that time, but they're no longer accurate, my friends. And and then there's a big whopper that I'm going to just lay on you at the end. If you stay, I am going to introduce and propose, okay? And some people in the field, they may like try to crucify me for this, or they might actually agree, or they may not, but I'm going to just introduce some new language and some new terminology that as a fairly, I'm going to call myself an ignorant person because I went out of the corporate knowledge management space for several years, went into helping other authors, speakers, coaches, people that wanted to escape their day job. And now I'm looking back to the place where I came from and I'm like, did, did people really implement this? Well, I mean, I, I could see from book sales that they were not, this is not, I, you know, at the risk of disappointing you, this was not a best-selling book, okay, even in the tiny little Amazon niche. So it should not, on the one hand, surprise me that the industry is, in some cases, other than the best of the best, it's kind of the same way that I left it. And again, it's not, I mean, that sounds a little grandiose, haughty, and egocentric, but that's also the reason why my mind was blown, because I'm like, haven't you guys fixed this? <laughs> and what I realized is so many people that are in my old position, they're doing the same things they used to do. They're doing deadline-driven e-learning or instructional manu manuals or consulting, and they are doing deliverables. Nobody out there is tasked with solving the the 40,000-foot problem, okay? So is it any wonder that I see the same problems that I left six or seven years ago? I Go figure. Am I, am I the golden boy? No. Am I the chosen one from the old karate movie? You know, chosen one. <laughs> chosen one. Nathan, you are here to solve this issue. I don't think so, but... They haven't solved it, so there's still a problem. In 2017, going into 2018, we have the Internet of Things, okay? We have solved the technology problems. We have Facebook. It works very easily. You can embed your videos on your phone, and it all mostly works usually, and once in a while you have a little bit of a glitch and you're really surprised, but you don't have to be a programmer to broadcast to the whole world anymore, yet knowledge between an expert, a subject matter expert, and the rest of the organization 
we have expired assumptions, okay? We thought some large truck that has ground to a halt, if you heard that high-pitched scratching noise, hopefully you didn't, but I did. There it goes again. Crazy. Anyway, organizations think that knowledge is the answer. And what I'm here to say today is it is going to cost your organization if you don't have something more than just knowledge and experts and yes, even instructional designers and curriculum designers and all of that. You can have all of these people on your payroll and if you don't have something more like culture and like, I'll, I'll just let it out of the bag, leadership in these areas and, and culture is shared leadership. It's shared empowerment. And if you don't have that, I'm, I'm sorry to say, your organization might as well look, maybe start looking for another position for yourself in another organization that does have a good culture. Because these expired assumptions are absolutely going to bite your organization where the sun don't shine. Sorry to say that, but that's why we're on Facebook right now, not on LinkedIn, because you, you wouldn't say unprofessional things like I just said on LinkedIn, but you might say it on Facebook. Okay, here we go. So what is number one? Okay, let me, let me try to finagle this a little bit. Here's number one, the first expired assumption, and I can already see this isn't going to work because I've got... <laughs> I've got all this and, and I don't, I don't know how to do it. I'll just have to lift this up. Okay. Here's the biggest assumption. And you know, I got to say this, you know, I always had a teacher and maybe you had a teacher. What does assuming do? When we assume, what does that make happen? Okay. That makes turns, uh, a this out of you and me. Okay, that's a cute way of saying assumptions when we assume that creates, that makes a this out of you and me. And when you spell out A-S-S, -S, which is what this is, plus you and me, that spells assume. And I'm using the, the different tense of the word right here. But that's what happens to these organizations, okay? When we think that knowledge can be managed, that's the biggest expired assumption of all. Knowledge cannot be managed, okay? I just gave a, a TED Talk on this, okay? I am looking, actually, I'll, I'll just show you. I'm, I'm so egocentric about this. I actually framed the program, okay? And I've got it stuck in a picture frame, but I was, I was a speaker, okay, at that event, and I talked about how problems can be managed, okay, but people must be led, and we have to lead other people with empathy. And you know what? Knowledge is really something, unless it has been codified and documented into something like this, which once you do it and you kill the tree and you print it out, it's pretty much expired knowledge. So where is the living knowledge? Where's the living knowledge? It's in your head and it's in my head and it's in our hearts and we engage with it, but we don't really manage knowledge. I would say after taking fresh eyes and fresh look after six or seven years at the industry that I came out of, I would now say that this whole idea of knowledge management is a complete crock because we can't manage our knowledge because knowledge is really a part of people and we can't manage people anymore. All right. This is not the Flintstones or the Jetsons. OK, the Jetsons, George Jetson, he was even managed, but that's not our world today. Even though George Jetson was futuristic, we can't manage knowledge workers anymore in today's economy. You know why? Because when people feel like they're managed, guess what they do? They walk, all right? People quit bosses. They join organizations. They join causes to make a difference. They join brands, but they are going to walk away from people who overmanage them. And that includes the knowledge in their heads, okay? 
Now, there's a solution to this, but we haven't gotten to the end of the Facebook Live yet. So you got to hear me out. Now, Dave over here, who just uh, graced us with his presence, I don't know that he's still here anymore, but he wrote a great book about whether are you a boss or are you a leader? And that totally comes down to uh, you should buy that book because, I mean, that that is great for knowledge management professionals. OK, you can't manage people anymore. They're going to walk. They feel managed. You feel kind of constrained. You feel kind of freaked out. And the best in class are not going to tolerate that anymore. So the biggest assumption, I think, of all is that knowledge can be managed. We can't manage anything but problems. And yes, knowledge, the right application of knowledge can manage the problem. OK, but we have to lead people and I'm defining knowledge as this living, active stuff that we're living, sleeping, working, and breathing. And then hopefully, if the knowledge managers are doing their job well, then we're able to post it. And but then it needs to, then it needs to be kind of managed once it out once it once it is out there. Okay, what about the living futuristic knowledge? of the problems that that haven't even arrived yet, of the problems that we have yet to solve. What about where's the knowledge that's going to solve those problems? Well, the knowledge isn't going to solve the problem. It's going to be the people that have the knowledge that apply their current knowledge that will solve the current problems, if that makes sense. Okay, so I don't think that we can talk about knowledge as some you know, fixed commodity that is going to be manageable. I think the biggest knowledge is the current knowledge, the the unrealized knowledge that we have. Okay, what's the second thing here? Now, this is going to be fun because this is where it all falls down because uh, here it is. Okay, number two, all right, knowledge is neutral. Knowledge is neutral. That is a assumption that is going to cost your organization a lot of money. I'm looking for something to, to prop this up on. I see a couple of books right here. I'm going to use this. I'm going to prop this thing up right here before I go any longer. Knowledge is neutral. Now, I know that that is uh, blocked by the... I'll uh, put some more books here. I've got my 150 page book, maybe, maybe 150 page. Yeah, that'll help. <laughs> knowledge is neutral. Knowledge is not neutral. Knowledge is not a commodity. Knowledge is a part of people. And what I would like to propose instead of this assumption that knowledge is neutral, I don't think it's neutral anymore. I think knowledge, this is going to be controversial. I think knowledge is not neutral. I think knowledge is a weapon. I think it's a strategic weapon that in certain kinds of organizations that are best-in-class organizations, in a good way, in a best-in-class organization where people are not managed, but they are led and they are leading one another, and they are all sharing leadership of a shared company culture, then knowledge can be a weapon for good to solve problems, to be applied to fix problems that everybody owns. But in anything outside of a best-in-class organization, okay, so in eight out of ten organizations or maybe nine out of ten organizations that are the lower eight or the lower nine that are not the best-in-class, knowledge is a weapon, and it's not a positive weapon, okay? In all of them, knowledge is a weapon. In the top, tippy-top, best-in-class organization where people are leading one another, leading each other, all sharing responsibility for culture, for fixing things, for owning problems, then it's going to be a weapon for good. But in all the other organizations, it's going to be a weapon for oneself. It's going to be, now think about this, people aren't stupid. Subject matter experts are not stupid. They are going to have a little bit of a tendency to hoard or save or disclose part of that knowledge, but there might be a whole other area of knowledge that is, uh, I call it the poker SME, okay, subject matter expert SME. So real close to the chest. You don't want a poker subject matter expert, okay, 
in your organization. But the only way that you route that out is to have a culture of knowledge leadership and knowledge sharing by everybody, and you onboard the right people that are going to share and going to help and are cause-driven, even if they know more than everybody else, okay? So knowledge is not neutral. Knowledge is a weapon. And in the best of class organizations, knowledge is a weapon that everybody uses and the subject matter experts use to defeat problems. In all the other organizations, knowledge is a weapon for subject matter experts to be able to have job security or maybe leave the organization and maybe they'll come back if the price is right, okay? And they'll come back as a consultant and uh, uh, they'll charge a whole lot more for the same knowledge that they had when you, as the organizational leader, were paying their salary, paying their benefits, paying their retirement, their, uh, their, their pension, uh, all the other educational benefits you're paying for their next degree or their next certification or the next conference. Knowledge is not neutral, my friend. Knowledge in the 20 teen decade, not in the 20 aught decade of, of 15 years ago, but the 20 teen decade and the 10, 20 tween decade, if that's even a thing, is a weapon. Okay. What's our next little, uh, thing here? What could it be? All right. Number three. Here we go. Knowledge is the solution. Okay, thinking that knowledge is the solution, knowledge is the answer, that is a assumption, and that is going to cost your organization big bucks, because knowledge is never the solution. It never really, well, I guess it was the solution back when things were a little more static. Sorry, going to knock this over here. When we had books that we would write and we could just go to a library and we could stroll and smell the flowers and we could we could uh, just have a slower pace of life and things didn't change and update on us and iterate and interact with one you know other things and 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 uh, you know in a slower world maybe knowledge was the solution maybe it was at one time but today it's not what's the solution well the solution is people applying the knowledge together to fix the problem. You know, the, the solution is when people get away from a knowledge management mentality because we can't even manage our knowledge anymore. We can manage people and we can motivate people or we can hire motivated people, cause-driven people, responsible people who are also mission and cause-driven and we can have culture that is best in class culture so that we care about people and we don't lose our humanity or leave it behind. And then those people will get the knowledge or they will extract the knowledge, but then they will apply the knowledge and see that the knowledge gets in the hands and the minds and in the groups that it needs to be to solve the problem. But it's not the knowledge that solves the problem. It's the knowledge in the right person's hands and minds being applied in the right way uh, according to the right criteria to actually solve the problem. But knowledge is not the solution, sorry to say. And if your organization thinks that way, you're going to be left behind, okay? Now, uh, I need another book to prop this up, okay? Uh, let's, let's go for the big guns here. Sorry, everybody, I didn't See, this is my knowledge. It's not the solution. What I needed to do was take extra time to, i got a jigsaw puzzle right here. We are going to put this right on up here. Now, isn't this great? Okay, I'm going to stick it the right, right way. Whoa, we got a little bit of a glare right there. All right, and then we will pull it back. All right, what does this say? Knowledge, okay. Knowledge will fix things. Okay, we've got that. Knowledge will fix things. Okay, I'll put another book. I'll put my book back here. All right, that is another error. Knowledge will fix things. As I just explained to you, knowledge doesn't fix things. People fix things, okay? And it helps if people know what they need to know 
when they need to know it. And that is what we have labeled as knowledge management. And certainly there's a, a whole valuable component of that. People need to know what they need to know when they need to know it. And you got to get the people the information they need. Get the information, the right information to the right person at the right time. And that's what we have called knowledge management. Okay. But I'm, I'm thinking that that's great, but that takes time to set up. How do we get a broader definition of knowledge in such a way that we put the responsibility, the culture of responsibility upon the knowledge worker to be proactive ahead of the issue, ahead of the problem? Okay. I think we need to call this something different. And I'm about to tell you the whopper of what that is. But knowledge is not going to fix things. People using the right knowledge at the right time will fix things. I think when we call it knowledge management, I think we mean well, and I think that has served us well in the past up to a point. But I think because all the technology and artificial intelligence and all of this stuff is the technology is doing a better job of managing themselves, managing themselves than people like you and me are doing in managing ourselves as a group. You know why? People can't be managed. That's been my theory this whole time. People cannot be managed. We have to lead people. We have to inspire people. We have to care about people so that people will want to self-lead. And we could call that management. It's really self-leadership. And we need new words and new terminology to bring us into the future, okay, instead of an 1900s or the year 2000 version of these terminology. We're not in the year 2000 anymore. I mean, if you're a Generation Xer like me, in the year 2000, the whole Conan O'Brien thing, the year 2000, we think that that is the big thing, the year 2000. Well, that was 17 years ago, okay? The, the terminology of instructional design and knowledge management and all of that stuff. We need an update, my friends. The year 2000 was 20 years ago, okay? 20 years ago, we were like, oh, the year 2000's almost here. Y2K is coming. We need to update. And I'm saying 2020 is almost here and we've got to update. And you know, we should probably, instead of updating, we need to just start looking ahead five or 10 or 15 years, okay? I know that's a little loosey-goosey. I think we need to do it. What's the final thing that is a bad misconception about knowledge management that I don't even want to call knowledge management anymore that will cost your organization a lot of money? Here it is, faulty assumption, okay? It's expired thinking that knowledge is going to go to the right place the right person in the right position and be used for the right purposes. That we can somehow manage knowledge, which the knowledge that we need to solve the problems that haven't happened yet or are happening right now that we didn't see yesterday, there's no way to manage knowledge. Okay, you can catch up and you can be always catching up. And that's one of the things that I don't like about this industry because I'd rather look forward a little bit and have a culture, a process culture of looking forward instead of just catching up, catch up, catch up, catch up, catch up. Okay. Maybe I like mustard instead of ketchup. I don't know. I like salsa instead of ketchup, but I don't like this culture of catching up that we have in the knowledge management instructional design industry. I don't like it. And here's the thing. If you have a problem that's a new problem today, OK, it's a catch up issue. It, it's going to take people days, weeks, months to create the content and then somehow think that it's going to go to the right people. I know it's blocking this. The right people, the right places. Here's another book Okay, that it's going to go. And we need another book and we need another book. OK, now you're going to see all of my books right here. Is this crazy? My friend Peggy's book. Right there. Let's let's do this. Let's put my book on top. <laughs> let's see my my book on the top here. All right. So you're going to have the right people, the knowledge man, that you can somehow manage the knowledge to go to the right people in the right place 
in the right position and be used for the right purposes. My friends, it's not going to happen anymore. And it's not going to happen quickly. And even after you spend a lot of money to make this stuff happen, it's certainly not going to go and, and be manageable, okay, to the right person. And then if you do get it to the right person, that's easy to get it to the right person, okay? But will it be in the right place? Will it be used in the right place? I don't know. And will it be the right positioning of that knowledge or the person in the right position, okay? And will it be used for the right position or, or for the right purpose, okay? Those are a lot of P's, all right? I just don't know. I just don't know. So what's the big shocker? I'm going to take this all the way down. I'm going to take all this stuff off, off of my desk here, okay? What's the, what's the big underlying whopper game-changing, um, the game-changing terminology that you're going to throw out to the world here at this point, Nathan? Using, of course, Facebook Live, which, as we all know, is the most professional <laughs> not of all media for this, okay? I'm just having fun with this. That's what happens when you leave an industry and look back and realize that, that there are even bigger issues potentially than the ones you left behind. My friend Lefford, have you, has your TED Talk, uh, passed a, a million views yet, Lefford? I mean, you're certainly on your way, <laughs> my friend. It's good to see you here. So here, here is the biggest expired assumption about knowledge management that wasn't even on this top five. You ready? Here's the biggest expired assumption, number one or number zero, okay? I don't think we can call it knowledge management anymore. Did you pick that up? Those of you that have seen this whole thing, did you pick up that I'm not a fan of that word management and even applied to knowledge Okay, and I know knowledge, I mean, you got people and you got to lead people. Okay, you got to manage problems and lead people. But I think that knowledge can't even be managed. At least the kind of manage, the kind of knowledge that solves today's problem or recognizes a problem today or a problem coming down the road that's going to hit us in a week or a month. Or the problems that we don't even know that we have yet. We can't not we can't manage that kind of knowledge that will solve that problem. Am I making this clear? I hope that I am. I mean, I, I just think that we have to up level this entire dialogue. I think we need to up level this entire conversation to include the things that we are aware that we are not yet aware of, okay? Isn't that what change management is all about? Is realizing, hey, there's a change. Get ready for the change. Okay, the change came. Now we're going to talk about it differently and we're going to change the change and manage the change. We have an awareness of that. But what about this idea that most of the useful knowledge that's going to be most helpful is going to be the living knowledge that has not yet been documented yet? And so the only way to use that kind of, that part of the knowledge, which is at least 50% of the knowledge, because half of our knowledge is knowledge of things that fixes problems or manages problems in the past, and we can write books and we can document all of that stuff. But what about the problems that we know? We don't know exactly what the problems are going to be, but we know the problems are coming and we know that... Uh, that we need to do different, we need to start collaborating and we need to start talking about the problems that haven't happened yet. I think that there's another word for that, okay? And another word could be culture, okay? And that's good to have a culture of collaboration and a culture of change management. But I think there's another name for the knowledge and the use of the knowledge and the proper proactive initiative driven use of the knowledge that we need. And that would be called leadership. Okay? Imagine that. Leadership. We need to lead ourselves and we need to lead our brains and lead other people's brains and use the living knowledge that we have that are still stuck in our brains 
And we need to exercise initiative. We need to exercise proactivity. We need to ask for, uh, 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 what we need to ask forgiveness rather than ask for permission. We need to, to drive these things. We don't have time to ask for permission. Okay. And if you're in a culture or an industry where you can't ask for permission, you have to, or, or you, you are required to ask for permission, you might be in the wrong industry because knowledge and solutions and problems happen a whole lot faster than that. And the answer is empowering people to solve the problems, to get with other people and figure out how to solve those problems before the man management or the executives even know about them. Okay, that's going to be the best in class organizations. All right. So I am proposing, I'm suggesting that instead of calling this knowledge, ma knowledge management and talking about knowledge management and knowledge management systems and learning management systems and all of that stuff. I know we need a learning management. So I, I get that, but I'm saying half the problems haven't happened yet. When we call it knowledge management, that just calling it management makes us kind of look to the past or makes us kind of think that we have all kinds of time to solve the problem and we don't. I want to call this knowledge leadership, even in an entire enterprise. Okay. I think it's a better idea to look at this, the body of work that we have, the living knowledge in people's heads, and the process by which we extract those things, and we call it knowledge leadership instead of knowledge management. You know why? Because leadership denotes leadership behaviors. And a lot of people today realize that leadership is not about a title or a position. Now, if that's your grid for leadership, that it's really management with a title and position, and you get to be the, the leader, then obviously that's I need to redefine that, which is why I just did, why I took 20 seconds to do that. Knowledge leadership means that the subject matter experts, the curriculum designers, the instructional designers, whatever your ecosystem, your knowledge ecosystem, personnel and talent are in your organization, that they are empowered as leaders to fix problems using knowledge and leadership and leadership behaviors. What's a leadership behavior? That's leaning in instead of waiting for permission. That's using initiative. And you know, I've got to say, in defense, in defense of subject matter experts, in defense of knowledge workers, in defense of instructional designers, curriculum designers, professionals, knowledge workers, in their defense, if you have the most brilliant, helpful, values-driven group of knowledge workers and you put them in a management culture or even just a highly regulated culture, which by law, you know, banking, pharmaceuticals, uh, life and death products, you know, those, those kinds of things, you know, we're, we're kind of shackled. Healthcare, all financial thing. Every industry is highly shackled, and that's a different discussion. I'm not saying, you know, I, I hope the current administration removes all regulations on every... I'm not saying that at all. I'm just making a point that in a, a, a culture of just management and wrist slapping and hand slapping and all that, which usually is just done uh, by governmental protective industries, okay? I'm just saying... I'm not saying that's a, even a bad thing because we don't want to be selling snake oil and, and all of that. But what I am saying is that human beings have been conditioned to think in terms of management and to kind of not be proactive and to be kind of waiting for the shoe to drop and to have to do things by consensus rather than leading with the problems that they can solve with trust with all of these different things. And even if you are in a highly regulated industry, I think we need to change it from knowledge management to knowledge leadership to give people a sense of leadership and ownership and proactiveness, even if they're not really truly able to be empowered in all those ways, because it's better to want to empower the people than it is to label something 
according to paradigms that existed 20 years ago before the year 2000. We're not in the year 2000 anymore. You, year 2000 is 18 freaking years ago, okay? And I just think we need to use new terminology to put a new paradigm and a new culture and a new uh, sense of not just empowerment or in responsibility, not just responsibility or burden, but empowerment for people. Do I have all the solutions to all of the little niche uh, can of worms that I just opened up in your industry or the next person's industry or the, the next hundred people's industry, hundred industries that have just watched this Facebook Live or Facebook replay? Absolutely not. I'm just stirring the pot a little bit. I just think that that we, we've got to be careful about that management word because it doesn't work for anything other than problems. It doesn't work for people. People are absolutely unmanageable. And I would say knowledge. I would question, highly question whether knowledge is even manageable in the sense that the kind of knowledge that we are going to have most valuable is going to be the knowledge to solve today and tomorrow's problems instead of last week or last month's problem. I hope that made sense. You better believe I'm going to download this and listen to it triple speed about 18 times to figure out what I just said and, uh, and be able to shore up some of the very bold assertions that I just made. But I want to thank you for joining me and I want to I, I just can't believe this is still a thing, that subject matter experts and curriculum designers, instructional design, that in everywhere other than the best-in-class organizations and cultures, everywhere else, it's still a pain point. I'm going to be thinking about this, and I'm going to be wondering if it isn't time to dip my toe back into that area of the industry that I left. I really kind of left it behind and, and did some more fun things. But I wonder if it isn't time to just kind of go back there and try to add value in, in frankly, in, in the corporate and organizational world from that place. Because I tell you, there is, I, I just think the new expertise, this might be my next TED Talk, but the, the new expertise, the new mark of a true subject matter expert of today and of the future is not your hard skills. It's not your certification. It's not your terminal degree. It's not, uh, you know, your client list. It's not the, the awards that you've won. It's not your lingo. It's not your vocabulary. It's not even your ability to truly be an expert as we define it today. I think the expertise of the future is going to be your soft skills. Because in a world where we're all high IQ members of Mensa and we've all got terminal degrees or we're working on them and we've all got certifications or we all, you know, we're all a certified, uh, you know, program uh, facilitator or, or whatever it is that we have and we can wrap, rack up more, the differentiator is going to be our ability to connect with one another in a meaningful way. I think that's the true subject matter expertise, the, the true expertise of the future. It's not subject matter expertise at all. It is people matter expertise. How about, how about that? People matter. And if you realize that people matter and treat them that way, like I've seen some exemplars in the last week, uh, as, as you've seen, I've been posting a lot about that. People matter. They become the new experts at connecting with people. And when you can connect with people, you can get stuff done. Thanks for joining me today. This has been a very daring, uh, one of the scariest Facebook lives I've done in a long time just because I handwritten a thing. I did a little cheesy Brendan Burchard, you know, list here. But I had fun and uh, I, I hope a lot of people uh, enjoy and appreciate this. And uh, if you think that somebody that you know has been wrestling with these issues, I'd love to hear what they think and just private message them the link to this or share this with them or, or whatnot. Um, 
Anyway, uh, some really cool things coming on the docket that I'm not going to announce at this time, but uh, some, some big, uh, big travel opportunities and uh, uh, work opportunities coming up. Very exciting. Uh, some, uh, some really cool things. I haven't really talked about the, the TED Talk that I gave uh, about a month ago. Uh, I've been laying pretty low about that. I may share a few things about that experience at some point in the future. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I am uh, actually have a coaching here in a few minutes, so I'm going to take it later and hopefully ingest a little bit of food. Take care, everybody.